Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, council meeting of the 5th of March, 2019. Just be aware that the uh, meeting is being live streamed or can be watched later on YouTube. So um, I just want to remind uh, councillors uh, and staff, if you're speaking, if you could speak clearly as though you're speaking to the person in the back of the room and use your microphone. So uh, that's important. Uh, we'll start with apologies, and we do have an apology from Councillor Catherine Stewart. I'll move that that be accepted and seconded by Councillor Kurak. All in favour say aye. Okay. Now, um, just to, because a lot of people don't attend council meetings, um, I'll just explain what happens. Before we get into the normal business of the meeting, we have a, an opportunity for a public forum, and uh, we've actually got uh, three and a half slots in the public forum, and the first will be Mr. Mark Ames. Um, Mark is going to talk about strategic cities. Why he's come today is it the only day he can be here. He's from London, so we'll hear him first. And then we've got Margaret Murray Benj and Jim Sherlock. They're going to split their time between them. And then Rob Patterson uh, and Richard Prince are going to split their time. And then a Murray guy to talk about, I think, bus parking, a, a little last minute thing that has come up. So um, well, I'll just welcome Mark first. So Mark, if you'd like to come forward. Uh, Your Worship, if I could just have yeah. a word just quickly about Mark. Mark has been um, brought to uh, New Zealand by the New Zealand Transport Agency and we, we took the opportunity to grab a piece of his time this morning for a staff workshop on um, communications and community engagement which is Mark's uh, specialist area of, of work. And uh, I think we're all aware currently community engagement is uppermost in our minds. So it was a very useful workshop, workshop this morning. And Mark's going to share some of those ideas with you now. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, Mark. Welcome. And press that button and then speak up. That would be great. Great. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, councillors. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's very good to be here. I'm just going to see if this works. Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, thank you for your welcome. My name is Mark Ames and I run a company called Strategic Cities. We specialize in community engagement, communications and media management, particularly with cities who are delivering difficult to achieve projects or contentious projects. Uh, my background is in communications and working in media and publishing. And in London, where I'm from, I was heavily involved in helping to bring about the former mayor of London's one billion pound 10 year bike plan Bringing around that plan involved many, many meetings, working in a space between politicians and the community, and hours of radio and television interviews. Uh, some of that uh, media coverage uh, I would describe as uncomfortable for the politicians, but as we'll see today, the outcomes have been worthwhile. Um, in short, I've been at the blunt end of city change. I'm at the blunt end of city change with the people that I work with, and I hope that some of the tips that I'm gonna share might be of interest to you. Um, as I mentioned, uh, London has a billion pound bike plan, but that's not to say that getting to that point was easy. Uh, a priest in London claimed that cycle lanes in London would do more damage to the city than the Luftwaffe. That's the German Air Force who bombed the city in the Second World War. And Britain's best-selling newspaper, the Daily Mail, said that cycle lanes were lunacy and a blight which had the potential to paralyze the entire nation. Uh, none of these headlines are logical, none of these headlines make sense, but they certainly do a very good job of selling newspapers. Sorry, forgive me. In fact, in the UK, the media have called people who ride bikes a number of interesting and frankly spectacular names. Lycra louts, bad cyclists, supremacists, aggressive morons, and even the cycling Taliban. Uh, this, of course, is not by accident. The more extreme the headline, the more papers the newspaper sells, or here in the 21st century, the more clicks the website generates. In London, uh, where I'm from, the relationship between uh, the cycling community and the uh, black cab driving taxi lobby reached a new low when the leader of the taxi drivers union called cyclists the ISIS of London. That's not particularly nice, quite frankly, uh, but by coming out with such a shocking statement, the person, the union leader who was opposed to plans for progress was knew that he was most likely to attract attention and generate headlines. This is how headlines about the projects that you're doing also happen. 
News is carefully curated to be sensational and to attract attention, and a lot of your detractors will know how to manipulate this, of course. Despite the rancor, London has changed. Until very recently, most of London's bike network looked like this. That is, in fact, a cycle lane, not just a drain with some paint on it. Uh, this is not very safe, it's not very inviting, it's not suitable for all abilities, and it's made <coughs> with seemingly magical paint. Uh, well, uh, London did change, uh, and change for the better. Um, it, the, the, there was a very strong community appetite to make things better for the city, but you would never know that if you only ever went by what was written in the papers. Uh, it was also a big political risk. Of course, the media were ready to criticize plans for progress, but progress did happen, and most of the cycling network went from looking like this to looking like this. London was only able to achieve such a radical change by having an exceptional public discussion about the role of the city streets and what the community wanted from the city in the future. That public discussion included a lot of media coverage, and I know that it's scary when the media and people start talking about your work in the press, but without that conversation, this change would not have been possible at all. London is not alone uh, in making big, bold, and positive changes for its public space. Uh, on the left, you might recognize Times Square in New York, and they do say if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Uh, on the left, you can see Times Square before, and on the right, you can see Times Square after. In the before photo, uh, it's a very large, wide, noisy, and busy road with a lot of vehicles being put through. On the right, that road has been closed and the space has been turned over to the use of people. Uh, the mayor of New York, uh, the former mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, uh, when he proposed this project, he was accused of jeopardizing the financial security of the city. Uh, and the newspapers even went on to say that this project threatened New York's ability to operate as a functioning center of business. That is to say, the reactionaries were very vocal indeed. Well, I'm glad to tell you that since the trial, which you can see on the right, was made permanent, vacancy rates in surrounding buildings have dropped, footfall has increased, spending has increased, rental yields have also increased. Uh, this woman that you can see is the former mayor's uh, transportation commissioner. Her name is Jeanette. Uh, and she uh, really defined this phenomenon that you see in the media of a, bike la a, a backlash against progress. And she's responsible for pedestrianizing Times Square and building many bike lanes in New York, so she certainly knows. And she said, any time you take on the status quo, it's going to be a fight, and the status quo is going to push back hard. I think what she's trying to tell us is that it's, it's, it's to be expected to experience some noise when you're enacting change. And she was speaking from very bitter experience. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're looking at these people waving placards and thinking, this is why I keep away from trying to rock the boat and making uh, exciting changes. But as we've seen, uh, actually making changes can result in really, really exciting outcomes. <clears throat> Forgive me, how much time do I have, Chair? Great, thank you. All right. Uh, this is a favorite quote of mine from the famous sociologist Irving Goffman. He said, individuals go along with current interaction arrangements for a wide variety of reasons, and one cannot read from their apparent tacit support of an arrangement that they would, for example, resent or resist change. Behind community and consensus are mixed motive games. I think what Goffman is telling us is that just because citizens aren't necessarily knocking on your door to ask for change, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't want it. When communities are faced with a new idea, that new idea isn't accepted all at once. Uh, and there's a model from a behavior change specialist called Alan Atkinson, uh, which demonstrates how that works. He calls it the behavior change amoeba. You remember amoebas are little cellular organisms floating around uh, looking for food, and they opportunistically reach out for something and latch onto it. And if they're successful, they pull the rest of the amoeba with them. Well, Alan Atkinson says that society is like this, and it doesn't just think one thing about new ideas, but that different people in your community play different roles in adopting new ideas. So on one side, you have early adopters, change agents, and transformers, people who are out there embracing new ideas, <coughs> and they're pulling the mainstreamers and the quiet recluses with them. These people are your thought leaders, your experts, the people who bless 
new ways of doing things. They might be the mum doing the school run who is the first to turn up with their kids in a cargo bike instead of an SUV. But pulling in the opposite direction are people who resist or even actively fight against change. And Alan Atkinson calls them curmudgeons, reactionaries, and laggards. I'm sure you've all met some of these people. In between is your silent majority, the big part of your community who are able to be pulled one way or another. Those people are very easily swayed by word of mouth within your community, but also by the media and the people that they see portrayed in it. <coughs> Uh, in London, forgive me, I've lost my place. Uh, in London, you can see these people are protesting against plans to create a safer street in their community. Uh, they're saying that in that coffin that they're carrying is the soul of their local high street. They were very, very reactionary indeed. These plans were exceptionally contentious and saw protests both in favor and against. Uh, and it would, could be forgiven if any politician were to see these sort of people marching towards them and would abandon their plans. Well, here's that same street today after the project had been delivered. And as you can see, it is an exceptional public space. So why were people so vocal? Well, I would argue people have an emotional attachment to the place where they live, to their routine and how, go, how they go about their day. And if your proposal to create a better city challenges their emotional attachments, it's likely that they'll have an emotional response, maybe even an irrational response to the plans that you have. We spend an awful lot of time trying to soothe the concerns of the negative side of the amoeba, when I suggest that actually the silent majority really do want to see progress like this. Emotions are rarely measured, they're rarely qualified, but they count for a lot in city making, as I'm sure you know. In Waltham, the community that you've just seen, the concerns of the negative side of the amoeba did turn out to be unfounded. Studies since the project concluded have found that traffic congestion has halved in the area, and actually the volume of traffic has halved in the area. Footfalls are up, and the local high street is thriving, despite what people said would happen. Better still, another study has added up the health benefits of cleaner air, quieter streets, more incidental exercise, and that study has concluded that children who live in that area will now live for longer as a result of the scheme. I'm quite certain that that's the reason why people like you become politicians. In this next image, you can see Boris Johnson opening his cycleway through central London. He's on the bike in the blue suit on the left, and he's opening it alongside the campaigners who were pushing for change. By the end of all of this process, the two, people, the two groups who at times were oppositional and across opposite sides of the same table were celebrating a shared achievement. Engagement done well is worthwhile, and leadership is rewarding. We've certainly come a very long way in London from cyclists being called ISIS. The cycle superhighways, as you can see, were built, and the outcomes have been truly spectacular. They've really changed the way the city moves. London had to have a difficult public discussion about the future played out in the media. It demonstrated why change was necessary, and it convinced enough people that change was worthwhile. Winning that public discussion was, uh, frankly, a challenge for politicians, but I would suggest that you can see that it was certainly worthwhile. So I encourage you to be bold. Thank you very much. <laughs> Surely not, not around this table. Well, thanks, Mark. Mm, I think we found it interesting, and even those people that are here for other topics was an interesting thing to read, because I see one or two people interested in transport, like Max Lewis in the audience, too, so I found that Good interesting luck, as well. So it was a, an unexpected bonus. Thank you. You're welcome. Now we go on to our other speakers in the public forum, and first is going to be Margaret murray Binge and Jim Sherlock. So if you'd like to come forward... Mr. Mayor, uh, councillors, staff, and members of the public, I'm Margaret Murray-Benge, and I'm here 
before you because I want to support our Mayor, Greg Brownless, and the three councillors, Councillor Robson, Stewart, and Brown, who asked you to honour the past and transfer 11 Mission Street to the Elms. That was the original intention when that property was purchased by Tauranga Council in 2009. I may have that date wrong, but it's some time ago now. It was quite explicitly understood at that time that 11 Mission Street would be transferred to the Elms, but the transfer was never actioned. And uh, uh, former councillor Bill Faulkner is here, and he can tell you that under Stuart Crosby's leadership, the instruction was signed off to Mr. Poole to tell him to action that transfer, and it never occurred. I couldn't get it, um, any information as to that, but councillors, I do recommend that you look for it. I've asked myself in light of this present debate why anyone should care what you decide, but the answer is clear. The Elms is an historical living treasure that is unique to the whole of New Zealand, not just Tauranga. Previous mayors and councillors have acknowledged this national treasure and I have supported its, and have supported its survival and maintenance and invested accordingly. When Reverend Brown settled here with his family, even before the treaty was signed, his family endured major traumas, but they never gave up on their vision to create a centre where everyone was welcomed in peace. So began in harmony European culture being shared with local Māori. The Elms is still a living museum loved by all those young and older of every race and culture. I know how much Western Bay's Katy Katy Boutique Museum is treasured, and 11 Mission Street could be equally valued as a boutique museum. It is a critical part of the Elms, linking to an historic military cemetery too. So ownership should be tra transferred directly to the Elms. Transferring it to a trust makes no sense at all. I therefore urge you to reconsider your previous decision and transfer the ownership directly to the Elms. Future generations of New Zealanders will be grateful to you, and so too will your ratepayers. We are a young country, and preserving our past treasures is our responsibility. If there is a dispute as to who owns whom from the past, that is for government to resolve, not the ratepayers of the city, as indeed successive governments have been doing over the past uh, last deca three decades. It is totally inappropriate for ratepayers to take on the responsibility of providing compensation for the alleged sins of the past. For the sake of the memory of Reverend Brown and his family, and for the sake of today's ratepayers in Tauranga City, it is imperative that you councillors use your common sense and transfer the ownership of 11 Mission Street to the Elms without delay. That was the intention in 2009. We should not wait, we should wait no longer. Worship the Mayor, Councillors. My name is Jim Sherlock. I have the privilege of being the Chair of the Friends of the Elms. The Friends of the Elms was established 20 years ago with the purpose of to create public awareness of the Elms and support the aims and objectives of the Elms Foundation. Since 1999, the Friends have held numerous fundraising events and contributed tens of thousands of dollars to repairs and improvements. The latest was the automated watering system of the Elms Garden. The Friends are still active community group as demonstrated by many of our members here today. Land ownership. The 30th of October, 1838, 30 acres of land was purchased by a deed of sale, the Tipapa Block 1, and I quote, Known all men by this deed, we the Rangatira of Taronga do let go and sell to Reverend A. N. Brown, Tipara on behalf of the Church Missionary Society and to their heirs and assignees forever, the land that belongs to our fathers and us also. We have received 20 blankets, 10 spades, 10 adzes, 10 axes, 10 hoes, and 10 iron pots. The document was signed by 17 Rangatira and witnessed by James Stark for the 30 acres of land, which was then the northern tip 
of the peninsula. Reverend Brown bought that land, and in his words, it was a treeless waste of fern. 22nd of July, 1873, Reverend Brown wrote, I have purchased from the society the spot where I have no so long laboured, thus securing for myself and my wife a delightful home amidst the constant changes which civilization is making around us. He paid 1,452 pounds and 10 shillings for the 17 acres, which bounded in the north by the high tide mark, on the south by Brown Street, on the west by Chapel Street, and in the east by the harbour. That land was purchased from him. The Friends want to thank the, the Tauranga City Council for their initial half million dollars back in 1998. Uh, my handout said 88, sorry, it was 98, to match the settlers half a million dollars paid to the Elms property, which was bought for $1.5 million. Since the Elms Foundation was established, the council have contributed millions of dollars to preserve and maintain the Elms. We thank you for that. The Elms Foundation were unsuccessful in raising the funds to purchase number 11 Mission Street. So, in 2006, the council purchased 11 Mission Street for $825,000 and rented, rented it to the Elms on a peppercorn rental. In 2010, the Elms Foundation raised the money to protect the eastern boundary by purchasing 7 Mission Street for $1,287,000. I believe Mayor Crosby had instructed the town clerk to transfer number 11 Mission Street's ownership to the Elms Foundation quite a while ago. Once that happened, the Elms Foundation would have amalgamated the two titles and it would have provided a land area of 2,136 metres square on which to build a visitor centre and a museum to display some of their artefacts the council now has in storage. In December 2018, the council voted to transfer the ownership of 11 Mission Street to the Otamatata Trust. I personally have not been able to find any detailed information on the Otamataha Trust. Question, why would councillors Malloy, Borlock, Mason, Clout, Granger, Morris and Creech want to give 11 Mission Street that important piece of land to any other entity except the Elms Foundation? As it would make it very difficult to establish a, a museum in that historic precinct. I did supply the councillors with a map showing you how that piece of land would cut off the $1.287 million purchase without council money, I might add, which the foundation bought and, and cut it off as a separate piece of land. You must join it up, gentlemen. And I believe this is, an, this is a decision you've got to make, and those who make the right decision can be sure to be back here at the next election. Yeah. I do have time for a question, Councillor Morris. Do you want to ask a question? There we go. Is it working now? Okay. Look, I'd, first I'd just point out that it's not just gentlemen around the table. We've got Councillor Leanne Brown. Um, secondly, uh, Councillor Murray Benj, if I can just um, refer to the first paragraph of your statement today, uh, councillors Robson, Stuart and Brown asked you to honour the past and transfer 11 Mission Street to the Elms. Um, looking through the minutes, uh, my recollection of the meetings, uh, I haven't come across an occurrence where uh, all of those councillors have asked us to do that. I, I do recall the Mayor's statement at the meeting where uh, he did support transfer to 11 uh, of 11 Mission Street to the Elms, but I cannot think of a statement um, by councillors Robson, Stuart and Brown uh, that say that we should do that. 
Yeah, would, would you like to clarify that point, please? Yes, I would. Looking at the minutes, it was interesting to note that there was all sorts of amendments flowing around in your agenda, but at the end of the day, the people who voted against what you were doing, what you were doing, was in fact the ones that I have acknowledged. And their, their votes are recorded there, and they have put their seals in place, and that's why I acknowledge them. Uh, do you not consider there, there are five resolutions above uh, the resolution at the bottom of the page in which some of the councillors you have listed have supported the action? So do you think that in hindsight you should have perhaps looked, uh, and I appreciate as a member of the public, and you've also got a day job as well, it can be uh, tiresome to sort of follow council processes, but do you think that perhaps um, yourself and others should have looked at the five resolutions above? Uh, to have a more accurate picture before... Councillor Morris, I've got enough experience to be able to tell you I thought it was a muddled mess the way you dealt with the whole process. And so I'm not amused, and I recorded the people at the end who recorded their votes and wanted to highlight for you I thought it was a dishonourable performance on the part of the council. Margaret for coming in. How would you feel about the whole um, transfer if you knew that there was a guaranteed long-term peppercorn rent back to the Elms for that property and, and used for and used and and used solely for the purpose of the Elms uh, historic precinct? Does that change your view or not? Well if you look at the map you try building a building over two building lines, you'll have nothing but problems. You've got to amalgamate the titles, give us the visitor centre and the mini museum. This, this city needs a museum, for God's sake, and here we are wanting to, to do it and, and you want to give it away to someone else. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jim and Margaret. I didn't quite yeah. have my say on that subject, Mr, I, Mr. Mayor. You didn't? I, I'd just like to add that... Um, the process is muddled, and you know that as time goes by, it will only become more confused. You cannot guarantee that what you say now is what will happen in the future. It has to go to the Elms Trust. That Okay, thank you, Margaret and Jim. And now... Uh, Rob Patterson and Richard Prince. This relates to the Elms issues and it relates to 11 Mission Street basically on behalf of ratepayers. For the record, my name is Rob Patterson and I am authorised by Citizens Advocacy Tauranga Society Incorporated, known as CAT, to make this presentation on its behalf. Mr. Mr. Chairman and Councillors, thank you for agreeing uh, to hear my address. CAT was established in March 2006, incorporated in 2009, to represent the viewpoint of all citizens, both residents and ratepayers, to the Tauranga City Council, where issues of public concern arise, and in the case of question, uh, question here, the publicly um, funded Elms is not just some bauble to be... Okay. 
Yeah, no, that's okay. Fine. Okay, that's fine. Better? Yep. Okay, right out. And uh, the Islands is not just some bauble to be frivolously tossed around without fully informed public community consultation. TCC, TCC backtracks on its commitment, in our view. Taranga City Council resolved on the 18th of December 2018 by a majority of seven to four um, to a proven principle proposal to transfer 11 Mission Street, Taranga, to the Otamataha Maori Trust at nil consideration with some sort of lease back to the Elms on terms and conditions which are yet unknown. In addition, the council decision to transfer ownership of 11 Mission Street to that trust was to be publicly consulted on and reported back to council. With this proposal, council is effectively giving away a Tauranga City Council ratepayer asset with a current rating valuation of 1.07 million. And be warned, there may be some unwelcome tax consequences in this stratagem. The historical background, ratepayers and public investment in the Elms. The trust deed for the Elms Foundation was completed in 1998. Aims of the foundation were inter alia, dedicated to the preservation and promotion of the Elms historic site for future generations. There's a timeline there with the dates and the amounts. I won't go through those because they're pretty well known and they're recorded in the written summary. Summary, since 1998, TCC ratepayers 2.525 million and other funders as outlined have provided a total of 6.16 million in purchase funding towards the Elms developments or purchases. So TCC ratepayers and others have a substantial interest and investment in the Elms site. TCC does not charge the Elms rental rates with regard to most of its sites. There are some they do. In addition, for each of the past three years, TCC has handed out around $200,000 per annum plus miscellaneous payments to the Elms to meet capital and operating <coughs> costs. The council to change the original plan and release 11 Mission Street to outside unrelated Maori ownership does not fit with the Elms. And in our opinion, this conflicts with any future plan and in particular the 2011 master plan for the Elms as it reneges on promises to the Elms. All this for no good valid reason in our opinion. Cutting out this property will break the squaring of the boundaries, which was came about with number seven being purchased, impede the site development, and stymie the amalgamation of the various sites because of fractured ownership. The proposed gifting to Otamataha Trust will create a precedent, as John Robson expressed, for further claims on TCC land by Maori, particularly as they have, for some reason, think they have unresolved interests in the Te Papa block from Gate Power Reserve to Sulphur Point. On the 11th of January 2019, a Logema request was made to TCC in relation to an RMA application made by the Elms in early 2018 to develop the whole site. A half-baked response was received from Council, but the main question was not addressed, namely, what was the outcome of that RMA application, namely the decision reached. As far as I can see from the information or references provided, that information was not forthcoming. In February 2019, a further request, a Logema request, regarding de details of the trust was lodged with TCC, but as yet no details provided. I also requested by email from the main movers of the proposal, namely councillors Larry Baldock and Terry Malloy, and copies that are attached to this, the following information on the trust, namely copy of the trustee, details of beneficiaries, details of current trustees, certified audited annual accounts for the trust for the last three financial years, and what act the trust is actually registered under. As no response has been received, I think I'm entitled to draw my own conclusions on that and stress council would, of course, as a matter of fiscal prudence and to satisfy due diligence needed to have cited those details prior to any decision being reached to determine the bona fides and financial standing of the trust. Where is this information? In addition, council does not meet the principles outlined in section 14 or the public consultancy provisions of section 82 and 82A of the Local Government Act. Copies of those sections are attached. Uh, nor for that matter, TCC's own mission statement of openness, transparency, honesty and accountability. The desired outcome, ratepayers and residents must hold TCC to account and demand it does not renege on its promise to the Elms and demand that council reverse its decision to transfer 11 Mission Street to, uh, to the Trust for nil consideration. 
In addition, council must hold meaningful public consultation, then if appropriate, transfer the site to the Elms in line with the TCC original publicly stated intention. TCC should be protecting ratepayer assets, not gifting them to some entity whose wants may not align with the Elms ethos. Transparency demands that any proposal be available for public scrutiny. Council needs to properly consult with the Tauranga community, particularly when they say they will, listen to the wider community and abide by the community's wishes. In conclusion, with regard to the way this issue has been dealt with to date, to put it politely, the process is wrong and Council needs to address the obvious inequities immediately by revisiting and dealing with the issues properly. That is my presentation. Thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to address you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. I speak perhaps a little louder than Mr. Patterson does. Now, there is some good news. The good news is that I am not proposing to discuss the history of Tauranga from the first walker. So that should shorten our time back dramatically. Um, as has already been said, 11 Mission Street was purchased with the clear intention and expressed intent for it to be transferred to the Elms Foundation. The substantive proposal that comes from Council is that it be gifted to the Ota Tamaha Trust without, it seems, any thought to the consequences. Looking, for example, at the proposed idea of the lease, we have such comments in here from the elected members that it must, uh, what is it, if the land was to be transferred to the trust, should not then minimise their mana by imposing restrictions. And then we're going to have a so-called three-way deal. And I wonder whether does this mean we're going to all stand around holding hands, singing Kumbaya? It doesn't work that way, councillors. I have a background in land contracts and leases, property leases. And I do not remember any time somebody saying to me, uh, this is Bob Jones we're talking about, we have to consider his mana. In fact, I wasn't sure whether Bob actually had too much mana, but there you go. Um, question of precedent, of course this will create a precedent. And so will the a actions recently of the somewhat groveling uh, apology and mea culpas from the Anglican Church. These I simply couldn't believe, and it was enough to make me decide I should become a Catholic. What we have seen there from the church is not that the church proposes to provide compensation as they suggest should exist, but the council, i.e. the ratepayers of Tauranga, provide compensation. Their proposal, for those that don't know, is that the Cliff Road site be transferred to Maori interest and that the council, the ratepayers, should be paying for the building of a marae there. I suggest to the Anglican Church that perhaps they could consider the transfer of their beautiful building down there on Devonport Road, seeing that they are the ones that seem to think there's a problem. What we are seeing here is, a, is the litany of disasters that have befet, beset this council. We have seen Bella Vista, falling down the hillside, and this is going to cost millions of dollars. We have seen, what it w we will see, certainly see the millions of dollars that the Cayman is going to co cost ratepayers. Yesterday, after talking with Councillor Morris, and I must say, Councillor, we must stop meeting this way, people might start talking. I re began to wonder about a lot of things. I went down to have a look at the circling birds. <coughs> I never could have believed how much concrete must cost these days. Since I used the stuff, it must have gone up a thousand to two thousand percent. The, the problem also with the circling birds is the council had the bright idea that they would hold consultation after the decision is made. Do you feel that there is a kind of deja vu with this proposal on the Elms? The vote has been taken, and now we're talking about having consultation. 
How does that work? Has the council got the courage to do what is right? Revoke the accepted motion, return to the status quo anti, and gift 11 Mission Street to the Elms Foundation, as was the reasonable, as was the original consent, without consultation. And the reason I say without consultation is that any consultation is to will be now contaminated by the miasma of predetermination and bias. This is nothing more than grand gestures with other people's money, and in this case, ratepayers. It is time for council to look to their errors and correct them. Thank you for your time. Thanks, uh, Mr. Prince and Patterson. Um, we'll probably have to keep moving because I've still got one more speaker. Um, just so people know that uh, the matter is coming back to uh, council. Um, there will be some form of consultation because that has been passed uh, and we will have to wait and see what the decision is following that. So, yeah, Councillor Robson, yeah. Just a point of information from the your worship, if you like, or staff assistance, the length and depth of the proposed consultation and what's the requirement in terms of voting for revocation? We've had a request here from some presenters that they would like council to revoke. Can you sort of inform everyone what the rules are around revocation? So revocation and what's the length and depth of the proposed consultation? This is just to, to put you know, what we're doing in the public domain. Amy, are you here able to speak to that? Yes, I'm here through the chair, uh, Amy Driscoll, Communications Manager. Thanks. We are looking at the consultation and talking to groups. We will be promoting it through our online channels, the website will be promoting it through print channels, and we're looking to make it um, as available to people as we can through the period of March, the month March, late March. Does that answer your question, John? So when you say the period of March, March has already started. How, how long will the consultation period be? Sorry, I meant to say late March. So the consultation period, we're just, uh, it's two to three weeks. We're just tying down all of those details at the moment. We had hoped to start on the 11th, but we have asked for more uh, to be, to do more, some open days, excuse me, <coughs> to make, and to do more in that space. So we just need a little bit more time just to get it all set up. Thank you. Just a request to the Mayor that if the um, people speaking in the forum today, if when we've decided what we're doing and what form, shape, time, investment we're making in consultation, if that could be communicated to those people that have spoken in the forum. And my second question is, what are the requirements with regard to revocation? Because people often ask us to come in and change our minds, but it's not as simple as just there are some rules. If it's to be revoked at the same meeting, it's 75% of the members, but in fact, uh, if it's at a subsequent meeting, it simply could be on the receipt of a report by majority decision. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Baldock. If I may, just um, in response to Mr. Patterson, he deserves a reply to his, um, his emails and his questions about the Otomataha Trust. Uh, information. I, I think that's included in the resolution that the chief executive would be looking into. But we we are not the Otamataha Trust. So in your request for uh, the financial statements and all of these things, it, it is their trustee and their financial statements. Um, I think it would be up to them. You should possibly contact them and ask them for that information. But perhaps the chief executive can give some clarity on how we will reply to your email. Through you, Your Worship, uh, we'll provide the information we have and that it is appropriate for us to provide. If it's not our information, it may well not be appropriate for us to provide that. And if that's the case, we'll refer them to the respective agency or organisation that has the information. 
but either way it is the subject of, of further report to council in fact if you read the the resolution carefully it still has to come back to council so there is that opportunity mm. Thanks very much to the submitters. I, I have some uh, copies of my submission here. Okay. And they could be handed around. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the submitters and thank you to those that have come along to support them. Uh, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the scintillating council meeting or if you uh, have other things to do, you're also, um, you know, you may leave at any time. Thank you. Now, I've just got to. Now, we've got Murray Guy next. So, and I think it's bus matters, but you can tell us, Murray. Maybe just wait a minute or two because yeah. it's a bit noisy there. Okay, look, thank you very much. Um, that's, that's going. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, Your Worship, I hadn't intended to speak today, as you know, but unfortunately a councillor that was going to just raise a couple of questions was unable to be here today due to health. So if I could just touch briefly though on a couple of the submitters, I won't go into any arguments, but certainly some of what they said, most of what they said concurs with my own recollection as a former councillor in regards to the provision of funding for the benefit of the Elms. And I don't think it's common sense that's required, it's integrity to the process, so on that. I can't help but think of, it's not a president by the way, March, when was it, uh, Marsh Street and the, um, Chapel Street, sorry, I think probably set a president with the, uh, basically the gifting of the, uh, the mobile service station. So today anyway, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to raise briefly because you've got some uh, matters relating to transport in your agenda and I wanted to know if the elected members were aware that to my understanding there is not the provision of one tour coach park. Now, what, what I mean by that is if I choose to bring my tourists to, say, for example, the art gallery off the cruise ship, I can't. There's, there's no provision of parking. My, my tourists are mainly elderly. Some of them have transport, uh, sorry, mobility issues. Uh, many of them expect me to remain with them because I'm their host, tour guide and driver. So I'm just creating that awareness. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Martin. In fact, you might answer the question, is there one dedicated tour coach park in the city for the provision of enhancing tourism? Oh, oh, so I'll carry on. So, yeah, you can perhaps answer that. Um, it's highlighted also, Your Worship, by the fact that this afternoon I have a pickup, for example, at Trinity um, Hotel on Dive Crescent. Now, it strikes me somewhat strange because it's, we're there quite regular, but unfortunately we can't pick up or drop off our passengers um, we've got four coaches there this afternoon um, in a legal and or safe fashion because there is no provision for parking within the confines of the hotel, neither is there provision for parking. So I'd just like to make a suggestion to Mr Parks and his team and the councillors if they would revisit or at least visit the provision of coach parking so that I can support the art gallery and other initiatives, be it Cliff Road, the Elms, reasonably handy to the city would be in fact adjacent Trinity Hotel on the northern side, so just on that. Now, as part of our tour coach cruises, uh, tours, sorry, some of the tours include a visit to our walker. You been there, Kelvin? Don't go out in it, mate. About three years ago, I made an offer, Mr. Mayor, to help relocate the walker because it was in the shadows, it's rotting, and it's such a travesty. So at the time they were redoing Dive Crescent, you'll recall spending some millions, and I saw down there the temporary placement of the walker being an ideal um, opportunity for the cruise ships and get it out into the sun. At the time um, it was an informal offer, but I was certainly very sincere. Um, I think it was Councillor Morris responded to me, look, I've, I've raised the matter with staff, but they are going to maintain and enhance the walker, carry out repairs to it by lifting the sides and have an interactive type of arrangement with the tourists. I don't, and he's nodding to concur. So that was three years ago, 2015. Here I am today, Mr Mayor and councillors, there has been not one dot of work done to that walker in that time frame. And I can't for the life of me understand why, because some of us around this table and in this room are espousing the virtues of having a, having a museum, somewhere we can display our history, be proud of our culture and all that type of stuff. So my dad would have said to me, listen mate, you demonstrate that you give a damn about what you've already got and then we'll revisit stuff into the future. So I'm just imploring you gentlemen, ladies, 
start looking at the waka, ask some questions, why is it rotting down there along with the shelter? Um, just have a quick look at my extensive notes here, Your Worship, very quickly. And I think that is about, hey, just a quick note, guys. Give a grant of 500000 to the Papma Surf Life Saving Club, which is out there adding value and saving lives, and you might consider transferring that 500 <coughs> from the eyesight where you've uh, budgeted $4 million. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, we have given a grant of around that amount to Papma Surf Life Saving. Yeah, yep. so give them another 500 Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay. yep. Now, uh, Councillor Bullock has yeah. a question and then... Um, yep. Mr Guy, um, just have to correct one little thing you've said, Certainly. which is rather a large thing. We, we didn't gift the mobile site to, um, to Iwi. It, they purchased it back yes. because of a promise I think you were involved in in 2005 when we needed to swap land for the second Harbour Bridge crossing. So it took a long time for that promise to be fulfilled, but it wasn't a gift. They purchased it, uh, and, uh, mm. and that's quite a different scenario just for your okay. information. Probably not a hell of a good question or a comment to make to me because I have absolutely zero recollection of any such agreement. And Mr Mayor, the community and the councillors might be aware that it was an NZTA project. And if as part of the NZTA project required additional land, my understanding of the Treaty of Waitangi and related issues was that it would have been the NZTA that was obliged to ensure affected parties were compensated not the ratepayers. But again, I don't remember any of that discussion. No, but provided me with the minutes of the meeting, Mr Baldock, and I'll certainly apologise and uh, perhaps even clean your shoes. That's it. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate the time. Uh, uh, I mean, there, there, there are stops around. We haven't got any debt. Yeah, I was just about to say that. I was just uh, say we, we, we haven't got any dedicated tourist stops, but I would encourage you to email me. You've got my email address, so and give me a list of sites you're interested in. I'll get my team to have a look at them and see what's possible, OK? I imagine then we'll hear from people who don't want to lose car parks for it, but however, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> you can't win sometimes. Thanks, Murray. And uh, that concludes the, the uh, forum. Okay, so any acceptance of late items? No. Uh, confidential business to be transferred into the open? I think it's. Any change to the order of business? And we'll go on to the minutes. So we've got three sets of minutes the 6th, 18th, and two from the 18th of, of December. So three sets, I'll take any. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've missed the... My eyesight's a bit shot. So it's two from December and one from February. Do you want to... Yeah, any changes? Councillor Brown? Yeah, um, can we just check, please, on page 28, under the key points, um, under 11 Mission Suit Otamahata Trust, that in the third bullet point we refer to the gift of land at one Mission Street. I'm presuming that's a typo and it should be 11. Can we just correct that in the minutes, please? A mover and seconder. Uh, it's moved by Councillor Clout, seconded by Councillor Morris. All those in favour say aye. Against, so that's carried. And then after a, a large piece of work uh, from Community and Culture Committee, um, oh, I forgot the conflicts of interest. Any conflicts of interest in the open section? Nope. Okay, recommendations from other committees and Councillor Malloy, uh, would you like to present the recommendations when they've been fairly thoroughly debated at your committee? Thank you. Um, yes, I, I would like to uh, pre present and move. Um, <coughs> I understand uh, that there we are going to change um, the um, option three, I believe it is. Not option three, item item three in that resolution. Do we have that change uh, that we can put up on the... Okay, 
Can that will that be part of this? Um, or just a, oh, a separate one? Do I move, have to move a separate one? Yeah, move it. Okay, I'll, I'll move it then. Yep. And and uh, sorry, so Councilman, well, just to get um, for some reason the numbering system seems a bit off on it. Oh, the one that I've got, I've got one, three, four, and five. Yep. I'll just see if I can find it. If you can just bear with me a minute. One to four. Okay, so, uh, if C Councillor Malloy, I guess you'll be uh, moving what is down as, count, uh, as recommendation one. one, four, and five, yes. which will be then renumbered, and then separately, you'll move a new resolution to authorise the chief executive to make further minor drafting or presentation amendments. Is that all right? Correct. Yes. Okay, so you'll move what's written down in our agenda as one, four, and five. So we've got a seconder for that. Yep. Yes, that's why we, that was not in the original thing. That's why yep. we have to do yep. it separately. Number three was not in the original yep. draft. Yeah. So we've split it out. Okay, so seconded by Councillor Brown. Okay, and do you want to speak to it any further? No, well, it's a big job. Yeah. The two of them, just to thank the staff very much for the work they've done. It was a, an incredible piece of work and took some time um, and it was thoroughly worked through. And uh, yeah, just very much appreciate what's happened and, and uh, move it. Yeah, look, the, the substantive motion, as a matter of fact, just about everything in the policy I'm comfortable with, but I would like and I will be voting for the motion as long as I can put on record my concerns with regard to the discussions around Badminton and Tatu Reserve. So if we can have that on record somewhere, it's obviously now on record, it's on the audio. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to support the motion, I just want that written in the minutes somewhere, my reservations with regard to that discussion. Uh, with your indulgence, uh, Mr. Mayor, question to the Chief Executive or anyone else appropriate. Um, what discussions have been held uh, with Bay Venues Limited regarding badminton? So I met with uh, the Chief Executive of BVL the day following the, the, the meeting uh, and discussed the, the opportunity for the badminton hall to be sited on the Bay Park site. Um, and he was open to that and uh, Mark Smith may well be able to give us an update on how those discussions are going. Good afternoon through the chair. So after the Chief Executive spoke with Gary Dawson, I went to meet with Gary Dawson, I met with his staff. We've got a small working group together from council staff and we'll look at a number of options, um, do some analysis or pros and cons of each one of those, maybe four or five sites on the Bay Venues lease area and then bring something back about what is best and what is not. Just in relationship to Councillor Robson's request to have his reasons noted, there was an incident in the minutes, which I actually was going to bring up at the time, but we flicked over it. Um, but on page 34, he, he requested the same thing to be recorded, his reasons, his concerns about uh, a resolution. And I'm not sure that there is provision. W if all elected members started asking for their reasons for voting yes or no to be recorded in the minutes, they would become very long indeed. That's the purpose of the debate we have where we, where we outline our reasons for why we vote. So I'm just not sure that that should be allowed as a standard practice here to have these things noted. Point of clarification, Your Worship, I didn't ask for my reasons to be recorded, I just asked for my concern to be recorded. That's very different. Concern is a seven letter word which doesn't occupy too much space in any minutes. The list of my reasons are manifold and could take pages. Okay, well, it will, there will be a general comment about concerns in the minutes, which I think will be fine. Yep. Thank you. Speaking to the uh, motion, Your Worship, now I'm grateful to uh, the Chief Executive and staff for engaging with Bay Venues and having that conversation. It was something that uh, a number of colleagues expressed concern about. Some were comfortable with the Tatua Reserve, or uh, rather the Sopa Reserve, 
um, but that conversation um, was important and I thank them for doing that. No right of reply. Okay, so I'll put that, that's one, four and five. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, that's carried. And then could you separately move three, authorising the Chief Executive to make any necessary minor drafting or presentation amendments? So yep, I'd have pleasure in doing so. I'll okay, move that. and someone second that, Councillor Morris. Any discussion? All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, that's carried. Thank you. And then now we've got uh, DC 22, Bay Venues, CBD Recreation and Le Leisure Hub. So who's going to speak to that? It's so we're going to have a speaker from BVL. Yep. And I'm not sure if Anne Blakeway's here today or not. No, thank you. BBL are providing an update today on the progress of a feasibility study uh, by Visitor Solutions um, looking at an aquatic and recreation facility in the CBD. It's expected that the results of the feasibility study will be presented to Council uh, at the end of 2019, um, at, at which point no doubt decisions will be made as to whether to continue with the project or not. So uh, just while we find BVL, um, I just propose adjourning for five minutes. Will uh, allow me a quick break. Thank anybody else who needs one? Thank you. So, can you press the? Button?